Awesome. Good morning. There we go. Love it. If we haven't met, my name is Bailey. I am the next-gen resident here at PCBC, um, which means I get to work under two phenomenal leaders, TJ Morrow and Travis Cook. Um, I mention them because later on, if you need to know who to blame for giving me the microphone, it's on them. Typically, I get to work with our middle school students, and it's awesome. But this past week, as Sam said, I got to rub some shoulders with our fifth grade students during Kids Takeover, and it was a blast. If you're a parent in the room of a child that came out this week, or if you're a leader in the room that helped us out, you knew that it was awesome. We had so much fun, although this weekend, my knees and my voice are starting to regret doing that this whole week. But I love working with kids. In fact, I know we've got some, some Pine Cove friends in the room. I actually worked at Pine Cove Towers. My wife and I both did for three summers not too long ago. So I, I just love hanging out with kids. They're so much fun. And something I was reminded of this past week when I was doing takeover is that kids, sometimes as crazy as they are, have the potential for seeing some things more clearly and more profoundly than even we as adults do sometimes, right? Sometimes you'll be hanging out with a little kiddo and then they'll say something and you're like, oh, wow, I've... I've never even thought about that, or I, I can't believe that just came out of your mouth. And you're like, I can't believe you're the same kid that just dumped a whole bottle of Coke down an anthill right outside the cabin. What is this? The story that we're looking at today comes out of Matthew chapter 8, and it's very similar to where we see this, this Roman centurion, right? The, this military leader come forward and say something so profound in just two sentences to where a whole crowd, including Jesus himself, stops, and he says, wow, I cannot believe that just came out of your mouth. I am so impressed. And what we're talking about today is a topic that I feel like, especially in the church, often gets really muddled and messy, and sometimes we don't really know exactly what we're talking about, and that's faith. Right? If you've heard that word faith, maybe you've heard of saving faith or placing your faith in Jesus. Maybe when you've been going through a rough time, faith has been used as a Bible band-aid of, hey, that's okay. Just keep the faith. Brother, just keep the faith. You'll be okay. Or maybe you've been a victim of when, when things are going wrong and you just can't seem to figure anything out. Someone has looked you in the eyes and said, no, it's actually your fault because you don't have enough faith. You don't have anxiety or depression. You just don't have enough faith in God. So the story that we're looking at today, I think gives us a very clear picture into actually what Jesus wants us to have in regards to faith. So as we're talking about faith today, as I'm, and as I'm throwing around that word, I want us to have a clear focus on this definition. Faith is believing Jesus can do what he says he can do. It's as simple as that. Faith is believing Jesus can do what he says he can do. And faith is one of those things that's talked about in a lot of places in the Bible. And for such a simple thing, it's also very complex. There are lots of different angles on it. So as we're going through this story, I want us to have that clear vision going forward, but also acknowledge that there are a lot of things that we can use to put in our tool belt to help define our faith. So in its simplicity, I want to look at three things this morning of, of how faith is also kind of a paradox. It's simple, but it's complicated. First is that faith is humble yet confident. Second, faith is inclusive yet elusive. And number three, faith is powerful yet available. So first, faith is humble yet confident. Let's read out of Matthew chapter 8, starting in verse 5. This is talking about Jesus, and it says, when he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. Time out. So if you've been with us for a while, you would know that we have been going through the book of Matthew. Last week, Travis Cook stood up here and preached out of Matthew chapter 15 on a very similar topic, 
about this Canaanite woman that came forward to Jesus who was begging Jesus to heal her child who was sick. And he talked about how faith acts as an antidote against our doubts. But this week, we're looking at a story that's backwards in the chapter 8 of Matthew. And this takes place right after a very famous discourse that that Jesus gives. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. It's chapters 5 through 7. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaks to a crowd and he announces the kingdom of God and he explains how to live in God's kingdom. He gives us the Beatitudes. He says, blessed are the meek, the merciful, the peacemakers. He tells us how we should live our lives. Here's how to pray. Here's how to not be anxious. Here's how to love your enemies. And after that sermon, at the beginning of chapter 8, it says Jesus comes down off the mountain, and this is when he starts bringing the kingdom of God into the lives of broken people. So the first thing he does is he heals a leper, and now we hit verse 5 when we now have a Roman centurion coming in asking Jesus for help. So Jesus enters the craft, or he enters the town of Capernaum, which actually ended up becoming the home base of Jesus' ministry. It's where he found a few of his disciples and where he performed a ton of miracles. But actually in Matthew chapter 11, he denounces Capernaum along with a couple other cities by saying, I am doing amazing things here and preaching the good news, but you are not listening to me. You don't have faith. He even says, if Sodom and Gomorrah would have heard these words and seen these signs, they would have turned and believed. But he's here, he's in Capernaum, and he's got this massive crowd behind him that, coming, that came in from the Sermon on the Mount. And then a centurion comes up to him, and it says he's appealing to him. Now, we actually know a good bit about this centurion. First of all, based on his title, we know that he is a Roman military official, likely over about 80 to 100 soldiers. It's likely that he wasn't Roman by nationality. It's likely that he was Syrophoenician. But nonetheless, he was put in place by the Roman government to lead these Roman soldiers. And in addition, we know that this centurion was a Gentile. Right? He wasn't a Jew. He wasn't a part of Israel. He was a Gentile. But for all that being said, for all the pictures that come into your mind of this big meathead soldier guy, we actually know that this guy was really good. He was a really good person. Uh, we see that in um, Luke chapter 7. Luke actually tells this story as well, but he gives us a few extra details than Matthew does. And in Luke's account, a group of Jewish elders approaches Jesus and vouches for this for the centurion, and they actually say he is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation and he is the one who built us our synagogue. He's a great guy, Jesus. You should do this for him. But even in Matthew, we can tell that that this guy has a pretty good heart in the way that he is caring for his servant. Because he comes up to Jesus and he says, Jesus, my servant is suffering terribly. This word servant can also be translated child, but in, in this context, it's likely that it really was a servant. Likely someone that stuck around the centurion, acted as an aide de camp, and, and did different tasks for him. And even though he was just a servant, the centurion is willing to do great things, go to great lengths, go all the way to Jesus in order to be healed. And even by the way he talks about his servant, he doesn't even mention that he's, he's to the point of death. He says he's suffering terribly. The centurion is focused on the quality of life that the centurion has. And furthermore, when he approaches Jesus, he calls him Lord. Right? This isn't the Lord that you might see where all four letters, letters are capitalized, meaning God or Yahweh. This is a a respectful greeting of Lord or Sir. But nonetheless, there's no reason that this centurion should approach Jesus politely, right? Because Jesus is a carpenter from the backwoods of Nazareth, nothing special about him, at least on the outside. So there's no reason that a centurion and the Roman guard would come up and politely ask Jesus to do anything unless there was something else up. So he presents this problem to Jesus. I think it's interesting that he doesn't, he doesn't even ask Jesus to do anything. He just presents the problem. He states the facts. 
And then Jesus replies in verse 7, says, and he said to him, I will come and heal him. Great. Problem solved. Simple enough. The centurion presents this problem and Jesus says, okay, I'm in. In some translations, such as this one, this sentence is translated as a sentence. I will come and heal him. But in others, it's translated as a question. So I should come and heal him? Either way, what what we're getting here in the sentence is Jesus is willing to come and do the work that the centurion asked him, but he also wants to dig a little deeper. He wants to know what the centurion really has in mind. And that kind of sets up the way that the centurion responds in verse 8. In verse 8 it says, But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. So Jesus seemingly agrees to help the centurion, and he says, wait, wait, actually, don't come into my house because I am not worthy to have you into my house. And then you can, you can kind of think about all the ways Jesus might be thinking of responding. He might say, wow, that's awesome. I, I think you're, you're picking up on, on who I am, and, you, and he might be pleased But then he says this thing about authority, and he might be thinking, well, does this centurion think he's like on the same level with Jesus? Does Jesus need to correct him? But look at how Jesus responds in verse 10. It says, when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. Jesus marvels at this man. It's not something that he does very often, but he turns around to this big crowd. Likely many of them are Jews. Likely many of them have heard what he said in the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, nowhere in Israel have I found such faith than in the two sentences this Roman centurion just said. So for Jesus to say something so profound, so against the grain, it should cause us, if we want to learn what is faith, how do we have faith, we really need to pick up on what the centurion is saying. So let's lean in. The the first thing that I see is that the centurion has an accurate view of who he is and who Jesus is, right? The first thing that he says is, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, even though anyone around would say, you're a centurion, you're over a hundred soldiers, you have way more authority than this carpenter from Nazareth. But the thing is, even though that's what society says, the centurion realizes that authority doesn't rest in military achievement or command of an army, but in the person of Jesus. Now, we can't confidently say here that the centurion 100% got that Jesus was God, that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, but we can definitely tell that based on what he knew, he clearly perceived that Jesus was greater and that he is less. The centurion's attitude was marked by humility. And he goes on and he says, for I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. What he's saying here is that he understands how authority works. The centurion says, I've got soldiers under me that when I tell them to do something, they're going to do it. So he says, In the same way, Jesus, you have authority. You're going to tell people to do things, and they are going to do it. And that's significant because the centurion is asking him to do supernatural things. He's asking him to heal his servant from a terrible sickness. He didn't go to just anyone. He went to Jesus because he believed that Jesus truly had authority over supernatural things. But look at what he also says. He also says that he himself is under authority. So above the centurion is greater authority. 
And it, what he means is that when he tells someone to do something, those soldiers aren't just hearing the centurion's voice. They're hearing the voice of higher authorities, right? Of course, the highest authority in the Roman government and the military is the emperor. So when this centurion who's been put in a leadership position gives an order, it's like it's coming from the emperor. It's like if you get pulled over and you get handed a speeding ticket from a police officer, it's not just that police officer that has that authority. They have the backing of the law. So what he's saying here is that Jesus, you have authority over many things, over supernatural things, but at the same time, you get your authority from even higher things. He understands that Jesus bears the authority of the highest authority which is God the Father. And for us, if we are to have true faith, we must approach God with a right view of who we are in relationship to him. If we misunderstand that, if we misunderstand these relationship dynamics, then we're not gonna be able to understand when Jesus says things like, I am the good shepherd, right? Because just there, it, it means that Jesus is our shepherd and we are the sheep that obey him. We're not going to be able to understand and take to heart when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, when he says that he is our satisfaction on a daily basis. We won't be able to understand our need for him because the gospel is all about God saying, you have problems that are too great for you, but I want to step in and help you. Regardless of who we are or who we think we are or what authority we have, Jesus' authority is greater than ours. His authority runs higher than ours and has power over more things than ours. Faith is inherently humble. But at the same time, faith isn't just relinquishing our own authority. It's placing trust in God as the ultimate authority. Faith is confidence in what Jesus can do. Look at what the centurion says. He says, but say the word and my servant will be healed right? Try that with your doctor. Doc, I'm not coming in today, but if you just say the word, my stuffy nose, gone. It doesn't work like that. But with Jesus, he's asking him to do incredible things because he knows that God's power defies all limitations, right? Jesus's power, it defies spatial limitations. Jesus, you don't even have to come to my house. You can be anywhere. Just say the word and he's healed. God's power defies time limitations. He doesn't need antibiotics. He's not asking for a treatment. He's saying, say the word and it's done. And God's power defies human abilities. He was asking Jesus to do incredible things with full confidence that he could do it. Faith is confident. And Jesus, when he responded, he wasn't just amazed at the bravado or the ministry impact of the centurion. No, what, what he was saying, look at this, what he was commending of the centurion was his simple acknowledgement that Jesus is greater and Jesus is capable. It's that simple. Faith is believing Jesus can do what he says he can do. And then he goes on, and we talked about how faith is humble yet confident. Now we'll see how faith is inclusive yet elusive. Let's pick up in verse 10. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what Jesus is doing here is he's painting these two groups, right? This first group, he says, is coming in from the east and from the west. That's an Old Testament reference to people outside of Israel, right? They're Gentiles, they're heathens, they are not a part of the nation of Israel, but what they're doing here that Jesus is saying is that these people are coming in, these Gentiles are coming in, and they are reclining at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? All stars of the Jewish faith. 
And what, what this picture tells us is it's a, it's a picture of eternal rest and eternal joy and eternal peace, right? This is, this is everything. If you were a first century Jew, this is what you were looking forward to. But Jesus says, no, it's not just for pious Jews. It's also for Gentiles. It's for the centurion. No matter who you are, faith is for you. You don't have to have everything together. You don't have to have a background in church. You don't have to know every book of the Bible. You don't have to listen to sermons in your free time to have some amount of faith in what Jesus says. No matter who you are, you can take Jesus at his word. Faith is inclusive. But the second group that Jesus paints, he says, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what he's saying here is that just as Gentiles will be in heaven, some Gentiles, there will also be some seemingly pious Jews who end up in hell. Why? It's because faith while it's inclusive and it's open for everyone, it's also elusive, right? Sometimes we think we can have all this faith stored up when in reality, we don't have any. Especially in our culture, a lot of times we think we have a lot of faith just because we have success or just because we give our effort. Or I find this especially prevalent for us when we have stability in our lives, right? As long as, as long as I've got a job, as long as I've got money in the bank, as long as my kids aren't doing drugs, I've got this whole faith thing figured out. But the thing is, faith, sometimes we don't really know how much we have or if we have it at all until we're tested, right? My, my wife and I, we figured this out this past year. I was given um, a job opportunity that would have taken us out of Dallas, where we both grew up, and taken us to a new city. And while it would have been scary, it would have been a total blast. And we were all in on this ride. We had just felt God confidently calling us to this, so we thought we, we thought that, um, that we were just going to be taken out of Dallas. Even while we were here at the beginning, we just felt a little bit uneasy, and we were like, oh, this is it. This is the answer. This is totally God moving. And we were like, God, we are right on board. We're right on board for this move. This is going to be awesome. And then literally overnight, that yes became a no. And suddenly we weren't moving. We weren't leaving. We were staying exactly where we are. And our first reaction was, God, what the heck? We had all this faith in you. We, we, we would have followed you to the ends of the earth. We, we would have done all these things. We thought we were so clearly being called here. And in reality, we, we had faith in God when he was giving us what we wanted. But then when he didn't give us what we wanted, we realized we didn't really have as much faith as we thought. And I'll be honest, having faith, trusting God is difficult. Taking God at his word is difficult. But here's the thing, even, even while God has made it plain, we still doubt. We still try to take things into our own hands. That's why we have to be extra careful and extra watchful because faith is elus elusive. Third point, faith is powerful yet available. Let's read the last verse in the story that wraps everything up. So Jesus commends this centurion's faith, and he paints this picture saying that, that faith is inclusive, but it's elusive. And then he turns from the crowd, turns back to the centurion, and he says in verse 13, and to the centurion, Jesus said, go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. So Jesus doesn't just commend this centurion's faith. He gives him what he asked for in the first place, which is the healing of his servant. Not just that, but the supernatural, miraculous healing of his servant. And while we know that God doesn't always answer our prayers exactly as we might want him to, we are certain that, that God can and often does powerful things. 
right? I think this is the hardest to believe when things are mundane, right? When we're just going to work, going to school, picking up the kids, doing normal life. We forget that faith is powerful, that there is power in the gospel, that God can do great things. In fact, when faith is painted throughout the Bible, often it's paired with some great picture, right? Faith the size of a mustard seed can move a mountain. These great pictures of faith. And what I've seen in my life is that even when things are slow, even when I might not believe that, that faith in Jesus is powerful, what helps me is just taking that first step, right? If I feel distant from God, if I feel like there's no power that could be had in my life, I look at James 4, 8, where James says, draw near to him and he will draw near to you. Now, that's not a transactional statement, do this, get this, but it is a promise that whenever we are putting ourselves in opportunities to be used by God, God will meet us there. Whenever we are trusting in what God has to say, he's going to walk alongside us and do incredible things, right? Out, out of nowhere, I've seen God do incredible things in my life. In, in fact, um, the summer before I went to my last summer at Pine Cove, my wife and I, she was then my girlfriend, we were talking about what are we going to do about all my student loans. I had a lot of student loans at that time, and we spent weeks just saying, ah, what are we going to do? And we go off to camp, and in the middle of camp, my parents show up to camp, and they said, hey, surprise, we're moving into our dream home, and we're paying off all your student loans with that move. And I was like, what? God does incredible things out of the blue, and here's the thing, we have to believe that faith is powerful. When we trust in God, when we believe in what Jesus says for us, there is power in that. But not only is faith powerful, it's also available, right? Just as I said, it's inclusive, it's open to anyone. There's also not a limit on it, right? If I buy Amazon stock, eventually, if I just keep buying Amazon stock, I'm going to own all of Amazon and not have any stock left to buy. But that's not how faith works. Oftentimes when faith is limited, especially in the Bible, it's not because we've run out of faith to get, it's just because we can't get ourselves there. We don't have enough faith to get there. But the truth is, trust in God is, is unlimited. It is powerful. Why? Because the trust in God that we have is based on his power and not ours. Faith is powerful yet available. I love how you can tell kids something as an adult, and no matter what you tell them, half the time they will believe you just because you're an adult. And I think sometimes we need to have this childlike faith as well. Jesus tells us that in Matthew 18 to come to him with the faith of a little child. Why? Because children, they believe authority a lot of the time better than we do. We don't believe God and take him at his word. And in Romans 1, Paul paints this picture and, and he says, if you think that God isn't talking to you, if you think that there is no room for faith, look at creation. Look at what God has made. Look at the human heart. Look at the scriptures. We have no excuse because God is clearly communicating to us. I've been a believer for about 15 years now, and the longer I do this thing, the longer I'm walking with the Lord, the more I believe that the Christian life is typically spent spending way too much trying, time trying to figure out what God has already made clear. Right, if you've ever tried to explain a board game to someone, and you're like, all right, here's how this board game works, right? Here is the objective, here's what we're doing. These are the different players, this is what all these different rules mean. All right, here's what we're gonna do. These are my, this might be a wrench that gets in our way, but we're gonna push past this. We're reaching towards this goal, and we are going to win this way. And the other person goes, wait, wait, what'd you say? How do we play this game? I feel like that's how God feels all the time, where he says, come on, I'm giving it to you. I'm giving you softball pitches, slow and steady. I'm giving you the truth that you need. You just have to believe it. God says, you want to know how to spend your money? Do you want to know how to lead your family? Do you want to know how to have better relationships? 
Well, guess what? I've already given it to you. That's why in 2 Timothy 3.16, the scripture is said to be God-breathed, literally God's breath, the word of God. The centurion, all he had to go off of was probably rumors, maybe some inklings from the Sermon on the Mount, maybe a little bit from the Jews that that he was over. But friends, we have been given so much more. And that's not a burden, that's a gift. We have been given so much of what Jesus has to say to us. All Jesus wants is simple faith. He wants us to see him clearly for who he is and believe the word that he says for us. If we're gonna enact this faith, we have to submit ourselves to God's authority We have to pay extra attention to the genuineness of our faith. And then we have to trust that God will use our faith powerfully. Just as the centurion believed that Jesus could do great things, friends, I believe that Jesus can do great things in us. If we just believe that faith is believing that Jesus can do what he says he can do. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for who you are. God, thank you that you don't get your authority from anyone. You are the authority. God, thank you that you have given us the keys to life, keys to your kingdom. And God, I pray that you would just give us the faith to believe you. God, especially as we leave this place and we, we go into what might just be another normal week, God, I pray that we would give it to you. God, I pray that we would step out in faith I pray that we would read who you say you are in scripture. I pray that we would talk with other believers and lift each other up. God, ultimately, we we trust you with our lives and we believe that you are in control. So God, thank you for this day. Thank you for every person in this room. God, thank you for the sunshine and for your splendor. And it's in your name that we pray, amen.